I would be remiss if I did not point out we have a special guest with us tonight. He is our, uh, well, we have a very special guest over here in a minute, but we have a local guest who is here with us as well. I guess I shouldn't call him a guest. He works real hard here every day. Uh, our library director, Mr. Duke Blackwood. Duke. Okay, so tonight I will be brief in introducing our speaker because frankly, having just sat in the line where Mark signed so many books, you would not be here if you didn't know exactly who he is and <laughs> why we've invited Mark to speak at the Reagan Library. So let me just stick to the highlights. First, we set a record last year here when former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice visited us. Until now, she, the uh, crowd she drew was the largest of any event we have ever held through our Center for Public Affairs. As I said, until now. <laughs> Tonight, Mark's appearance has set a new record and you are part of the largest crowd we have ever had for one of these events. In fact, when I saw Mark in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, I did my best Roy Scheider imitation from the movie Jaws and told him, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> <laughs> we have never before had a speaker in such demand who sold out so quickly to the point to where we definitely wish we had a bigger auditorium. So my apologies to the many that we had to turn away when it was a sold out. And to the hundreds of you we've actually who are watching this from very large screens in the Air Force Pavilion next door, but I know that it will be worth it to all. This excitement over Mark's appearance is only natural, I think. Mark Levin hosts the fourth most listened to talk show in the nation. And it is obvious his listeners cannot get enough of him. Last year, his show was expanded from an amazing two to three hours. He is rated number one in his time slot in New York, Chicago, Dallas, Fort Worth, Detroit, Washington, DC. I am now certain we can add Ventura County to that list. <laughs> Unlike a number of famous TV and radio personalities, Mark does not venture forth from the bunker a whole lot, <laughs> preferring rather to oversee the landmark legal foundation where he is president, spend time with his family and his cherished dogs, and of course, to focus on his craft. And that is remarkably sharp, thoughtful, and conservative commentary on the key issues of our times. Now, we claim Mark as one of our own here at the Reagan Library because in addition to a love that we share for President Reagan, our 40th president, Mark is actually a Reagan alum. Mark served as an advisor to several members of President Reagan's cabinet, as associate director of presidential personnel, a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Education, Deputy Solicitor of the Department of the Interior, and ultimately Chief of Staff to an extraordinary gentleman, Mr. Ed Meese. He is the best-selling author of several books, his most, most recent being one you all know about, Liberty and Tyranny. When I say best-selling, I mean it, as this book is now at a stunning 1.2 million sold and rising I think he must have signed 100,000 more tonight, <laughs> making it the number one book on Nielsen's book scan and number two on Amazon.com's list of best-selling books of 2009. <laughs> so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the great one, Mr. Mark Levin. an enormous honor to be at the Reagan Library, don't you think? This is a spiritual place. And when they said to me, we would like you to come to the Reagan Library to talk about your book or anything else you want, I said, me? Really me? 
They said, yes, you. And I want to thank John, who has done an extraordinary job here, and Melissa, and all the other folks at this library. This is a magnificent place that deserves our complete and full support. So thank you very much. I don't have any teleprompters. I don't have any chalkboards either. And I love Sarah Palin, but I'm not writing on any body parts either. Old fashioned paper right here. I don't give a lot of speeches and I don't wanna just wing it because you took your time to come here and these are very, very important times. So I want to hit a few issues, and maybe when we have time, some questions and answers. Now, a few years ago, I decided to write Liberty and Tyranny, mainly because I felt that conservatism needed to better explain itself, and it needed to be better promoted. It was being misrepresented by pseudo-conservatives, who are people who pretend to be conservatives, but trash conservatism so they can get jobs at places like the New York Times or get invitations to appear on Meet the Press and Comedy Central, which are very similar anyway. <laughs> now, it was said by Republicans that the era of Reagan is over. Conservative principles were simply not good enough arguments for Republicans anymore and that we had to accept the inevitability of extra constitutional, if not unconstitutional, government. Some so-called Republican leaders were predicting the end of the Republican Party. They said it couldn't win in places like, say, New Jersey or Massachusetts, <laughs> if Republicans didn't move leftward and reject rigid conservatism. Now, the problem, of course, was that the Republican Party had not moved right. It had done exactly the opposite. It had lost its way in its identity. It abandoned the principles of our founding, our conservative principles. And it adopted the incoherent and defeatist advice of the pseudo-conservatives, who had dispirited conservatives and emboldened the left. And it even nominated one of their own for president in an exercise of predictable futility. And so I undertook this 16-month task to write Liberty and Tyranny, a book basically about conservatism and non-conservatism, Liberty and Tyranny. And with the copies that have been sold, I hope it played a little role in some of the very good things that I see happening, not in government, but outside of government today. And the good news is that much has changed over the course of a year. I'm here to tell you that the era of Reagan is alive and well in the cities, towns, and villages across America. I am here to tell you that we are not going to roll over and surrender our liberty and private property to the government. I'm here to tell you we are not going to be intimidated by the statists and their mouthpieces in the media and academia and Hollywood. This is our government, and we intend to force it back into the box we call the United States Constitution. <laughs> but while there's growing urgency among the citizenry to stop the transformation of this society, there's growing urgency in Washington to stop us. We must condemn the doctrine of regulation by masterminds in whose judgment and will all the people may gladly and quietly acquiesce. Were it possible to find masterminds so unselfish, so willing to decide unhesitatingly against their own personal interests or private prejudices, men almost godlike in their ability to hold the scales of justice with an even hand, such a government might be in the interest of the country. But there are none such of our political horizon. 
and we cannot expect a complete reversal of all the teachings of history. Now, to bring about government by oligarchy masquerading as democracy, it is fundamentally essential that practically all authority and control be centralized in our national government. Now, what I just said to you was said in 1930 by New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It's now 80 years later, and it's much worse than it was in 1930. These are perilous times, and perilous times require blunt and honest talk. So distant is America today from its founding principles that it's difficult to precisely describe the nature of American government. It's not strictly a constitutional republic because the Constitution has been and continues to be easily altered by a judicial oligarchy that mostly enforces, if not expands, the status agenda. It is not strictly a representative republic because so many edicts are produced by a maze of administrative departments that are unknown to the public and detached from its sentiment. And it's not strictly a federal republic because the states that gave the central government life now live at its behest. So what then is our government? Well, it's a government steadily transitioning toward tyranny. And it threatens to devour all of us. We conservatives stand for nothing more or less than the defense of the American society, that is, the civil society, as Edmund Burke and Aristotle and many others referred to it. In the civil society, the individual has a duty to provide for himself and his family. He has a duty to be a good citizen. He contributes voluntarily to the well-being of his community, church, or synagogue, and he respects the unalienable rights of others. The civil society has a cultural identity, and that consists of the traditions, values and customs, tested over time and passed from one generation to the next. In the civil society, private property and liberty are inseparable. The individual's right to live freely and safely and to pursue happiness includes the right to acquire and possess property. What is property? Property is the manifestation of the individual's physical and intellectual labor. To illegitimately seize it is to enslave him. A just and predictable rule of law provides the governing framework that undergirds and nurtures the civil society. In our case, the United States Constitution. So for the conservative, the preservation and improvement of the civil society is paramount if we are to remain a humane and free country for the alternative in one form or another is tyranny. Now, we conservatives understand that liberty's permeance in American society often makes its manifestations elusive or invisible to those who are born into it. Even if liberty is acknowledged, it is often taken for granted and its permanence assumed. Therefore, under these circumstances, the status agenda can be alluring. It is not recognized that it is increasingly corrosive threat to liberty, but that's what it is. Liberty's poison. The modern liberal is not a liberal at all. The classical liberal is the opposite of an authoritarian. It is wrong, therefore, to call him a liberal. Some have taken to calling him a progressive. This is the term the liberal now prefers to assign to himself, progressive. But there's nothing progressive about a regressive ideology, which is why the word statist best characterizes the true nature of our adversary. And they are our adversaries. He promotes what Alexis de Tocqueville accurately described as a soft tyranny. Now, what do I mean by a soft tyranny? You thought I'd just come up here and rant and rave, didn't you? <laughs> I may yet do that. <laughs> the statist. The statist rejects our founding document, the 
Declaration of Independence, for it declares in part that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For the statist, liberty is not a blessing, for it is not possible to achieve utopia if individuals are free to go their own way. The individual must be dehumanized. He must be subordinated to the state. He must abandon his own ambitions for those of the state. He must become reliant and fearful of the state and ultimately molded by the state. I call them drones. <laughs> Individuals pursuing their own legitimate interests, living independent and self-sufficient lives, largely unencumbered by government, is an intolerable condition. The status utopia can take many forms and has throughout history. But they all wind up in the same place, tyranny. You see, this utopia they imagine is actually hell on earth. The primary principle around which the status organizes can be summed up in a single word, equality. Now, equality, as understood by the founders, is the natural right of every individual to live freely under self-government, to acquire and retain the property he creates through his own labor, and to be treated impartially before a just law. The founders did not confuse equality with perfection, and neither should you. Man is imperfect making his application of equality, even in the most just society, imperfect. Otherwise, inequality is the natural state of man, in that each individual is born unique. Therefore, equality and inequality, properly understood, are both engines of liberty. But the status misuses equality to pursue uniform economic and social outcomes. He must continuously enhance his power at the expense of self-government and violate the individual's unalienable rights, for he believes he must tame man's natural state to achieve utopia. The status must claim the power to make that which is unequal equal and that which is imperfect perfect. And you hear him do it every single day. If only the individual would surrender himself to the all-powerful state, the impossible can be made possible. Barack Obama made the point in 2008 when he said, quote, our individual salvation depends on collective salvation, unquote. But salvation is not Obama's to grant. It's not government's to grant. And in the wrong hands, it's tyranny's weapon. Now, having abandoned the limits placed on government in the Constitution, as he must, what are the limitations on the status ambitions over society? Where are they defined? Where are they written? The fact is they don't exist, and therein lies the problem. In proposing even bigger and more devastating spending, taxing, and regulating schemes, the status acts as if there never was a new deal or a square deal, or a fair deal, or a great society, and all the rest of it. And he doesn't much care. It's not enough that the federal government is already the nation's largest creditor, debtor, lender, employer, consumer, contractor, grantor, property owner, tenant, insurer, health care provider, and pension guarantor. His appetite for power is insatiable. To put a fine point on it and provide context for what we confront, the status is basically a malcontent. He is miserable about his circumstances and blames his condition not on himself, but his surroundings, other people, and of course, society. He searches for significance and even glory in a utopian fiction of his mind's making. He must destroy the civil society if, as he believes, he is to achieve heaven on earth or hell for the rest of us. This is the Messiah complex. 
and Obama is not the first to be inflicted with it, and he won't be the last. For much of our history, the balance between governmental authority and individual liberty was understood and accepted. For the most part, federal power was confined to that which was specifically enumerated in the Constitution, and that power was further limited with co-equal branches constantly vying to improve their positions against each other. Beyond that, the power remained with states and ultimately the people. But you cannot achieve utopia by adhering to our Constitution, for its very purpose is to nurture man's nature, protect the individual, maximize liberty, and diffuse governmental authority. Therefore, over the last eight decades, the status has steadily unmade the Constitution. The Constitution consists of words. Words have ordinary and common meanings. They bind together a society as well as past generations with future generations. When you read any contract, say a loan agreement, the terms and conditions don't change with the times. They are interpreted in the intentions of the parties discerned in the context of their original making. We don't have living and breathing mortgage agreements. <laughs> and we don't have a living and breathing constitution either. We have a constitution that allows people to largely do what they wish, as long as they don't commit crimes or do immoral things. We have a modern society. That's what the constitution has made possible. Those of us who share this belief are called originalists. And yet the constitution can be amended, and it has been amended 27 times, including the first 10 amendments, known as the Bill of Rights. The last amendment was added in 1992. Now the problem today is that the federal government and its various appendages act as if they are an ongoing constitutional convention. They seek to transform our society by rewriting our constitution virtually at will and without adhering to the amendment process. There is no reason to constantly alter the Constitution unless your purpose is nefarious. There's nothing in the Constitution that obstructs individual or societal progress. Nothing. In fact, it limits the ability of the federal government to interfere in our lives by enumerating its powers, not enumerating our powers. It obstructs politicians and bureaucrats, not us. Consequently, it is we who are living and breathing, not the Constitution. The Constitution is our bedrock, not a political expedient for ambitious statists. In Federalist 51, James Madison, who's often referred to as the father of the Constitution, wrote, but what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a constitution which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place oblige it to control itself. The most dramatic break with Madisonian democracy would come with the election of Franklin Roosevelt. That's right, the same Franklin Roosevelt who was railing against Herbert Hoover and his big government policies. Now remarkably, as I say, he ran for president on a platform of cutting government, balancing the budget, and increasing trade. He railed against Hoover's deficits, trade barriers, and high tax rates. Once elected, FDR not only embraced Hoover's big government politics, he massively expanded them. Numerous studies have since demonstrated that FDR took a bad economic situation and made it far worse, much like Obama today. Indeed, FDR's Treasury Secretary, Henry Morgenthau, Jr., 
wrote the following in his private diary. We have tried spending money. We are spending more than we have ever spent before, and it does not work. We have never made good on our promises. I say after eight years of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started and an enormous debt to boot. You won't find that in the New York slimes. <laughs> I had to dig that out of Morgenthau's diary, where it sits today. Nonetheless, in his 1944 State of the Union speech, FDR proposed what many of you now know is called the Second Bill of Rights. And he said this, people would have the right, quote, the right to a useful and remunerative job in the industries or shops or farms or mines of the nation, to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living, of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home and abroad, of every family to a decent home, to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy a good life, to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment, and to a good education. Can't argue with that, can you? Oh, yes, you can. This is tyranny's disguise. These are not rights. They are the statists' false promises of utopianism, which the status uses to justify all trespasses on the individual's private property. The Second Bill of Rights and its legal and policy progeny require the individual to cede his fate to the government. The issue is, and always has been, not whether human beings are worthy of good conditions and necessary things, but how best to pursue them as an individual and a society. Destroying this constitutional republic and the greatest economic system on the face of the earth ensures widespread misery, not happiness. The fact is that the Constitution and the New Deal the square deal, the fair deal, the great society, and the rest of them are largely incompatible. Now, I understand this is a controversial point, but it's the truth. The Supreme Court had to fundamentally alter the Constitution to accommodate FDR's agenda, and they do it today. And you can witness the consequences a federal construct with few limitations, which has all but destroyed the proper relationship between the citizen and the citizen's government, and the federal government and the states. In such a federal scheme, if is such a federal scheme is desirable, if not widely popular, we're told, including massive entitlement programs, then it should not have been difficult to persuade two-thirds of the members of both houses of Congress to pass the amendment and send it to the states where three-fourths would be required to ratify all this big government stuff. Instead, we now have a federal judiciary that has become the vessel through which the status agenda is routinely advanced. And by the way, lest you think the judiciary is the only part of government that can protect your liberty, and most of us here don't, speaking to the drones out there. <laughs> Let me remind you that the Supreme Court gave its imprimatur to slavery in the Dred Scott case, upheld segregation in Plessy versus Ferguson, approved the internment of Japanese Americans under FDR, and federalized abortion Roe v. Wade, among other notorious cases. Frédéric Bastiat, a great French philosopher, wrote in 1850, when the law has exceeded its proper functions, it is not done so merely in some inconsequential and debatable matters. The law has gone further than this. It has acted in direct opposition to its own purpose. The law has been used to destroy its own objective. It has been applied to annihilating the justice that it was supposed to maintain, to limiting and destroying rights which its real purpose was to respect. 
The law has placed the collective force at the disposal of the unscrupulous, who wish without risk to exploit the person, liberty, and property of others. It has converted plunder into a right in order to protect plunder. And it has converted lawful defense into a crime in order to punish lawful defense. And this is the essential tactic of the statist, plunder. And plunder he does. Remember, liberty and private property are inseparable. Private property represents the fruits of your labor, of much of your time on this earth. And the nature of your labor, whether it's voluntary or commanded by government, determines whether you are free. For this reason, the free market is the subject of the statist's relentless assault. The free market is the most vibrant economic system of all. It fosters creativity and inventiveness. It produces new industries, products, and services as it improves upon existing ones. With millions of individuals freely engaged in an infinite number and variety of transactions every single day, it is impossible to even conceive all the changes and plans for changes occurring in our economy at any given time. The free market creates more wealth and opportunities for more people than any other system. Now, I wrote in Liberty and Tyranny that the free market promotes self-worth and shared values, and it discriminates against no race, religion, or gender. For example, the truck driver does not know the skin color of the individual who produced the diesel fuel for his vehicle. The cook does not know the religion of the dairy farmers who supplied milk to his restaurant. And the airline passenger does not know the gender of the factory workers who manufacture the commercial aircraft that transport him, nor do they care. The Marxist class struggle formulation, pitting the working class against the wealthy merchant class, the proletariat against the bourgeois, still serves as the principal justification for the status assault on the free market. Yet it is an anathema to the free market, which empowers the individual to make of himself what he chooses. There is no static class structure in the free market. It is mutable and dynamic. Individuals born into great wealth can lose it. Individuals born into terrible poverty can acquire great wealth. It happens all the time. We Americans even gave it a name. It's called the American Dream. Consequently, Americans created the most dynamic economy in the world. But we've now reached the point where decades of government usurpation, in which private property rights and the Constitution's firewalls have been breached, has reached critical mass. In the last 14 months, Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi, here we go, and Harry Reid, <laughs> have used one-party rule to push this nation to the brink of bankruptcy faster than any cabal of politicians before them. They have no respect for the will of the people who, now on full alert, have demanded that they stop. They have no regard for future generations whose wealth they've squandered even before it's been created. They are driven by raw power, which they hope their ideological offspring will exercise for the next century should they succeed in their efforts. And who is left standing to confront this ideology, to slow it down, to contain it, and ultimately defeat it? We conservatives, that's who. <laughs> Conservatism is the only antidote to statism, for conservatives believe in the founding principles. Conservatives stand on the shoulders of the founding fathers. As economist Michael Boskin has written, in the first three years of the budget plan, Obama, Pelosi, and Reid will spend more of the gross domestic product than Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, the Vietnam War buildup, and President Reagan's defense buildup combined. 
The Obama, Pelosi, and Reid average budget deficit is $1.4 trillion, although I saw a report this morning it's now $1.6 trillion. Over three times the previous record in 2008. Boskin points out that their 10-year budget, unprecedented in its spending, taxes, deficits, and accumulation of debt, is by a large margin the most risky fiscal strategy in American history. By 2015, five short years from now, the Obama-Pelosi-Reed gross debt will reach 103% of all goods and services produced in the United States of America. And they did this knowing that Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are, in the aggregate, $55 trillion in the red in unfunded obligations. The pressure to massively increase taxes and impose a value-added tax, as an example, will be enormous. And the so-called rich, if any still exist, will not be the only people paying these taxes. It's an impossibility. The crushing burden will apply to nearly everyone, born and unborn. The way out of a recession, or depression for that matter, is to liberate the economy, not smother it. To liberate the people, not punish them, with more taxes and regulations. In 1981, when the economy was reeling from double-digit interest, unemployment, and inflation rates, President Reagan championed the passage of the Kemp-Roth bill. It cut individual federal income tax brackets by 25 percent, phased over three years, and indexed the rates against inflation to prevent creeping bracket increases in future years. The Act also instituted the Accelerated Cost Recovery System and a 10 percent investment tax credit, which led to a substantial increase in capital formation. In other words, you don't choke the golden goose to death if you want those golden eggs. <laughs> the goal was to create incentives by removing significant government barriers to investment, productivity, and growth. The result, inflation dropped from 13.5% in 1980 to 4.1% in 1988. Interest rates dropped from 18% on 30-year fixed mortgages in 1981 to 8% in 1987. And unemployment dropped from a peak of near 10% in the recession of 81-82 to 5.5% when President Reagan left office. Over the next 25 years, 43 million jobs and $30 trillion in wealth were created. Today we have something called a jobless recovery. I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> you ever heard of a jobless recovery before? You think such a phrase would have been tolerated during the Reagan administration? Everything's bright but the jobs. Now, do you think President Reagan would have tolerated a jobless recovery? Well, today we have neither a recovery nor jobs. What happened to that second Bill of Rights? Now, on top of their jobless recovery and bankrupting of this nation, Obama, Pelosi, and Reid insist on nationalizing the private health care system, which accounts for 17% of our economy, adding trillions more dollars in government spending and debt. And of course, in addition to the massive new costs, their purpose, their purpose, is to tether the individual to the state, making him literally and utterly reliant on it for his health and survival. Not only would the government have an ownership interest in private property, but also would claim one in the physical individual. And that's not nearly the end of it. Obama, Pelosi, and Reid want to control economic activity and human behavior in this country through the Environmental Protection Agency. If they have their way, the government will oversee energy consumption, industrial production, and individual mobility by monitoring and regulating carbon dioxide under the false science of man-made global warming. You know, they've had industrial management in other status societies. They call it the Great Leap Forward, I think. Uh, wasn't that great, really, in red China. And uh, Brezhnev kept coming up with five-year plans. They didn't work very well, either. Well, this is our turn, I guess. Meanwhile, Obama, Pelosi, and Reid have nationalized two of our automobile companies, 
and the student loan system, taken effective control over credit card companies and hundreds of banks, are targeting insurance, coal, and oil companies, setting salaries and bonus levels for a growing list of corporate executives, and using the government's taxing and regulating powers to wage a war against the private sector while rewarding their union and trial lawyer buddies. Their wrecking ball has crippled our economy, destroying jobs, destroying wealth, destroying home ownership, and they've granted one of our most dangerous foes, the red Chinese financial leverage over our country, which threatens our national security. We conservatives see this for what it is, the ascent of soft tyranny, which has the potential to spiral into something worse. And we must confront it, and many of you are, for which I thank you. But we need to increase our numbers, we need to increase awareness, and not just for this generation, but those that follow. Parents and grandparents must take it upon themselves to teach their children and grandchildren to believe in and appreciate the principles of American society and stress the importance of preserving them. They need to teach them that the status threatens their generation's liberty and prosperity, as he threatens ours, and to resist ideologically alluring trends and fads. We number in the millions, and we can counteract the status indoctrination efforts in this society by engaging our neighbors, friends, and coworkers, as many are doing today. Each of you can become, as I say, Paul or Paulette Revere, if you will, and confer your knowledge, beliefs, and ideals on your fellow citizens. We conservatives must act now. Time is short. We must be resolute in purpose, yet flexible in approach. We must search out opportunities and exploit them. We must be overt and covert. We must not reject compromise if the compromise is likely to advance our founding principles. But we must reject compromise if the compromise is of little consequence and a diversionary end in itself. Let us remember, first and foremost, that we are Americans. Let us take heart from those who came before us, from the founding of this nation and all the struggles between then and now. The challenge today is different in kind and in some ways more complicated than others. But we're up to it. We don't have any choice. Either we save this society or it will be lost just as sure as other great societies have been lost. I want to close tonight with the same quote from Ronald Reagan that I end my book with. President Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream it must be fought for, protected, and handed on from them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States of America where men were free. God bless you all and thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Mark has been gracious enough to uh, give us some time, just a few minutes, to answer some questions. So if you have a question, we have staff people walking through the aisles that have microphones, and when you raise your hand, I'll recognize you. I'm sure there'll be more questions than we have time for, but please just wait for the mic to get you to your, to your hand so that everyone can hear your question. So any questions? Yes, we have one right here. Uh, thank you for taking my question, Mark. I appreciate it. He took your question. <laughs> but I won't give you the answer. My question is regarding uh, health care. Yes. 
Um, since healthcare is not an enumerated power of our Constitution, which it is not, and since th these uh, powers are supposed to reser be reserved for the people and to the states, is it possible that the states could come back together and go to amend their own constitutions or pass necessary legislations to block all mandates and any other subsidies that will um, in increase taxes right. for uh, med the Medicaid program? Well, you know, prior to 1940, that might have worked. But I'm going to tell you something. First of all, I'm pr to, uh, proud of my state, Virginia, uh, which uh, the two bodies, the House and the State Assembly and the Senate, and the governor just signed uh, a statute uh, in which the citizens of Virginia, they claim, are not required to purchase any type of federal health care. And there are other states that are coming along the same way. Now, now, that said, the problem is we have a half a century of Supreme Court decisions. They call this precedent, um, which go the other way, and basically treat states as if it's, you know, the Department of Motor Vehicles somewhere. And the fact of the matter is the Constitution says one thing and this judicial precedent says another. So can these cases be brought? Yes. In fact, my group's looking at bringing one of them. The problem is we're in a forum that is hostile to us. I do take some positive indication of the Supreme Court, some of their five to four decisions, uh, reinstituting parts of the Bill of Rights. I just don't know uh, what Justice Anthony Kennedy will do in a uh, health care case. Now that said, um, there is also no precedent for the government compelling people, the federal government, to buy anything. And I hear this idiotic comparison to states forcing drivers to buy car insurance all the time. First of all, we don't buy, I have a car, you don't have to buy car insurance. Secondly, I notice that when you do buy car insurance, they do have pre-existing conditions. Have you noticed? You have a lot of accidents, you may not get car insurance. <laughs> So I don't know what the hell they're comparing car insurance to uh, life insurance for. Thirdly, when you look at this 47 million f figure with people without health insurance, it's a f bold faced lie. Go look at the census. Um, they use people. Uh, they don't say citizens, that's number one, and that's because about nine million of them are illegal aliens. Well, if we're gonna give health care to illegal aliens, why not just give health care to all aliens, wherever they're from? I mean. <laughs> Everybody come out of the shadows, wherever you may be. Um, but also, uh, about um, 12 million of those people can afford health care policies, but choose not to purchase them. Now, why in the hell should I subsidize somebody who chooses not to purchase their own health care? And, and why do I care, as a matter of fact? This whole idea that we should destroy our health care system to cover people who choose not to cover themselves, or illegal aliens, or people between 18 and 34 who believe they're going to live the rest of their lives, why would we destroy the greatest health care system on the face of the earth to cover those people? Let them get their own damn insurance. As a matter of fact, when I get a caller, and I had one a couple of weeks ago, a student, who said he couldn't afford health care, it is important for me to know more about that student if I'm supposed to subsidize him. So if I'm going to subsidize this student, then I want to know if he has a car. I want to know if he lives at home. I want to know if he has an iPhone. I want to know, I want to know if he has a colored TV. I want to know what his priorities are. Because if he has all those things, that's his problem. It's not mine. Now, let me just say one other thing. Some people might say, oh, you're so lacking in compassion, Mark. Really? <laughs> really? Well, under this government-run health care, let me tell you something. If you have a heart disease or cancer, if you're a senior citizen, or if you have a child who's born with significant birth defects, Let's see how compassionate Big Daddy government is then, because we know how they are in the UK and Canada, and they're not too damn compassionate.
Hello, Mark. I'm Patricia, and I flew all the way from Bloomington, Illinois, to wow. see you. Wow, thank you. I hope it was worth it. My, ar my arms are tired. Yeah. But I... <laughs> Henny Youngman. <laughs> I, I, I'm a housewife, yes, uh, a mother. Uh, I've been married for 21 years. And I, I just want to tell you, I thank you so very much for all you do. And I don't normally travel all the way across the country by myself. I'm kind of shy. But I wanted to do this and see you in person. Wow. And I have a gift for you. Remember Eureka College shirt and I hope your security detail gives it to you. First of all, you're a very sweet lady. Thank you for coming. Secondly, I am my security detail. <laughs> That's my security detail right there. One, one last thing is... Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, my son was accepted to Hillsdale Wow, College. That's great. He's going to turn out great. He's got a lot of hard work ahead of him, but that's wonderful. Thank you. Must be a smart kid. It's not easy to get into Hillsdale. Beautiful. And thank you for coming so far. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mark, for coming and talking to us. My wife and I are native Californians, and six years ago, we realized that the situation in the state had become bad. And we ended up moving out of state to Arizona where we felt we had some more freedoms, the taxes weren't as bad, and we had the opportunity to move forward. Now we so where are you going to go next? <laughs> right into my question. Sometime, the last election cycle made us realize that the people we used to look up to as being our leaders had moved on. It's come on to our generation that we have to start looking at what we need to do to save our country. And we don't have another option after this round, what we see happening. We can't keep fleeing. At some point, we need to know, we need to have the ability to say, this is enough. This is our country. We want it back, damn it. So we just sometimes feel like it's hopeless. But whatever encouragement to people like us out there, we, we're looking for it. Well, let me, let me tell you the something. Right thing. There are tens of millions of us who agree with you who are not going to sit on our hands. I, I do not speak for the Reagan Library. Let me just speak for myself. That's a legal thing I have to do. <laughs> but we better show up, and we better show up in big numbers, and we better show up in November. And I don't want to hear the two parties are exactly the same. And we better kick these you-know-whats the hell out of office as fast as we can. <laughs> I've got my kids here, so I have to be careful, too. Hi, Dr. Levin. Thank you for coming out to California. Where did I get this doctor, by the way? Is, am I a medical doctor or what? All right, Mark. Um, well, thank you for coming. Much I better. I listen to your show every day. I'm a big fan. And uh, one of the things that concerns me is, is the EPA saying that our, us breathing outward or exhaling is a pollutant, and they're going to regulate it. And I'm just wondering if the plants, I mean, the whole global warming thing, how, but how do you stop it if it's a federal agency, uh, m you know, doing this? I'm not sure. <laughs> and we do have litigation ready to go on that, as do a hundred other groups and organizations and industries and so forth. But once again, it takes us back into the court system and it was the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision written by John Paul Stevens that came up with the conclusion that carbon dioxide is a pollutant. In essence, there you have nine people who probably all flunked chemistry and biology, <laughs> who don't know a damn thing about science or anything else, but they're lawyers, so they're up there, and I'm a lawyer, but not a slip and fall lawyer. They're up there on that court, and they know all things. Now, keep in mind, even the Clinton administration didn't find that carbon dioxide. So absurd was that notion that, in essence, photosynthesis creates pollution. That is, the taking of our exhalant, which the plants then use to create oxygen, 
If they control carbon dioxide altogether, we croak. <laughs> the earth freezes, there are no plants, and human beings go away. And let me ask you, how exactly are they going to control carbon dioxide? How are they going to measure all this stuff? What are they going to do, go into the factories? And who's going to go in the factories? Uh, this is a very diabolical scheme that has been in the work for three decades. And uh, I think what's going to happen to some extent, not to put a downer on things, uh, but <laughs> I, th I think what's going to happen to some extent is some of these things are going to be done and the people are going to revolt. I think, uh, let's just hope it's not too late. The whole goal in carbon dioxide control is the old Soviet industrial production control. They even talk in sectors now, you hear this? The uh, car sector, the wheat sector, what the hell are they talking about? We don't have sectors. Uh, but I figure it's like a big chart on the administrator, the EPA's board, you know, this sector and that sector and this sector. But ultimately, that sector is your house. And it's your car. So much for liberals wanting to stay out of your bedroom, by the way. That sector over there. Hi, Mark. Thanks for being here. I have a concern about the, uh, about the RNC being able to put forward an actual conservative candidate that's going to um, be there in 2012. I've not heard you talk about that. Perhaps you have, but I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Because I don't care about the RNC, and they, I don't care what they put forward. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, they don't get to put forward anything. We decide these cases in state-by-state -state elections. Um, if you're asking me if there's a particular candidate I support right now, the answer is no. No, I wasn't asking you that, no. Okay, but as far as the RNC goes, why do I care? What can they do? This is the thing, and thank you for your question, because you hit on a point. We sit back and wait for the RNC, and sit back and wait for the ABC and the XYZ. We're doomed. And what I like, what I see what's going on in this country, people are saying, it's not up to him and her, and it's up to me. I'm going to make sure the people in my household are aware of what's going on, and they're ready to vote. I've got to make sure the people on my street are aware of what's going on. I've got to engage in the grocery store and in my place of work. I'm going to go to those town hall meetings, and when I'm told we need a rally to make a presentation, and it's well within 30 miles of my, I'm going to go to that rally. Who give the RNC is utterly irrelevant. It has had absolutely nothing to do with the rebellion that you see going on, and in towns and villages and communities throughout this nation, a quiet, law-abiding, civilian rebellion where we are saying from Massachusetts to New Jersey to Virginia and everywhere else, I hope, in November, screw you, we want our country back. Am I, am I the only one to say that in the Reagan Library? <laughs> Tell me I'm not, please. <laughs> Wasn't, didn't one of Gerald Ford's guys wants to do that? I don't know. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Uh, over here. Um, hi. My question is about Israel. And uh, I just read recently about Mullins talking to Netanyahu about backing off of the overwhelming force doctrine and now the wait and see if sanctions. I mean, it just seems ridiculous. I was wondering if you would comment on that. You know, uh, one of the things I've seen in Iran that, that have been very positive is the people rising up. One of the problems is they're up against the secret police and the Republican Guard and, and fundamentalists who have no intention of letting go. And there are things that a nation can do to support movements like that. President Reagan showed us with the Freedom Fighters and, and the Mujahideen. And we ought to be supporting those people and their movements in every possible way that we can. And there are things that I believe we can do, and I'm not going to get into them, having myself actually witnessed some of them when I worked in the Reagan administration. There are things you can do to a nation's economy, to its currency. There are things you can do to a nation in terms of uh, 
uh, providing support to, uh, to rebel groups or to people who want to speak out. And we're not doing them in any effective way. That's pretty obvious to me when the president the first time in that fraudulent, phony election uh, barely said anything. He didn't say anything for 72 hours. Uh, that was a big problem. As for Israel, let me tell you, Israel's going to do whatever Israel wants to do and needs to do, and she needs to operate on her own and forget about what Obama tells them to do. Okay, we'll take one last question right over here. <laughs> Hi. We represent a whole contingency up here from Santa Barbara, the Santa Barbara Tea Party. Yes. And number one, we want to thank you very much for coming, but we want to thank everybody for coming because Amen. what you are really seeing is a backbone, at least of America here, willing to do something. So I want to thank everybody. Now, wait a minute. If they can do it in Santa Barbara, yes. you can do it anywhere. Now, wait a minute. I, Except I, maybe Greenwich Village. Go I ahead. I stand to correct that. We have a Reagan museum in Santa Barbara, and Ronald Reagan lived in Santa Barbara County. Yeah, and what, what happened yesterday? <laughs> It's another question. Yes. I want to know what your position is on the Federal Reserve and when and how can we actually audit this group? My position on the Federal Reserve? You mean am I for it or against it? Or how we get rid of it and expose it? Well, you know what we had before Federal Reserve? No, no, no. Forget about the currency. What did we have before Federal Reserve? Does anybody know? No, what we had before Federal Reserve were about 12 or 14, at the time, they, they were multimillionaires, today would be considered billionaires, who on more than one occasion saved this society from crumbling through their operation in working on the currency. And it was actually very successful. And what happened is, in the beginning of the last century, in a decade or two in, it was decided that the government could do a better job of regulating currency than this essential handful of magnets, including uh, Mellon and Carnegie and some of the others. Um, so your question is, what do we do to get rid of the Federal Reserve? Well, well let's see. We can't go to court, because they're not going to get rid of the Federal Reserve. I mean, unless you elect enough people to Congress to get rid of the Federal Reserve. But my problem isn't so much, uh, maybe to your lament, getting rid of the Federal Reserve, but uh, getting the currency back on the gold standard. And whether it's the Federal Reserve that does that, I'm not so sure if we had together uh, the 10 wealthiest guys in the country, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, both of whom are liberals and others, that they would agree with uh, you and me. So I'm not sure I want to turn our currency over to them either. But the benefit of a gold standard, or a silver standard, or a peanut standard, or a popcorn standard, as Milton Friedman used to say, is that it takes the currency out of the hands of politicians and ties it to something of value. Because right now, it's not tied to anything. And that rooster, at some point, what did that idiot say? <laughs> Come home to roost. At some point, that'll come home to roost. And, uh, and the way it comes home to roost is through, sorry, I'm not up on left-wing, radical, fundamentalist, uh, Marxist uh, propaganda. I forget what that line was. Roosters, what, are, what is it? <laughs> exactly, you're up on it. So, <laughs> so I'm not sure that, about that. I will tell you this, the, the Federal Reserve, in my opinion, helped cause the housing collapse with its low interest rates. <laughs> Fiscal policy helped cause the housing collapse. Political policy and social policy with the CRA and the uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac caused the housing collapse. And there was literally no way anybody could predict it. It was so, ma and yet it was so massive and so under the radar and your concern is an important one, though, which is there seems to be a handful of organizations or individuals 
who are, eight, what does that mean? It's dinner time? Uh, it's like we're cutting you off. I don't. <laughs> let's go. So anyway, there we go. <laughs> a handful of, uh, of entities and individuals that have way too much control over this society. Uh, and in that respect, I absolutely agree with you. I'm not sure what we do with it, do about it. But uh, I was rambling. Let's end with one more. Okay, one last question. We'll take one uh, right over here. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Wait a minute, that one. Who? Uh, survey says. <laughs> that that crowd over question. there. Hi, Mark. I just came here from Canada on Monday. I'm having surgery this coming Monday. Oh, boy. Uh, first of all, first of all. Did you I'm sneak across the border or did you come legally? <laughs> Was it over the southern border or the northern border? I grew up in Northridge. I've spent the last 25 plus years in Canada dealing with the medical system there. And I, first of all, just wanted to thank the United States for the opportunity to be able to pay for my health care. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Um, I'm an American. I'm also Canadian. Um, I'm very, I've been very concerned about what's been going on there for so many years because I see how the government does tyrannize you through taking control of your body and your mind. And my daughter had major back surgery here. I've had surgery here several times. And I don't, I'm not quite sure how to educate people about the change in your society when you let the government take control of your life. I see Canadians very unsatisfied, very unhappy. Um, they don't like us. <laughs> they don't know us, but they don't like us. And as much as I can, I always try to tell the other side of the story. And I just want you guys to know that you are the greatest. Be proud of it. Keep opening your mouth. Believe it. We love you. Canadians don't love you, but I love you. <laughs> you mean your family loves us. <laughs> And we love you. The three other Canadians in my family love you. I have a daughter, 18. She wants to be a constitutional lawyer because you said that's what you were one day. Beautiful. Yes. So. Thank you. I think we just need to know that we are great people and the other people hate us because they want to be us. Okay. Thank you. And I might add... They owe our pharmaceutical companies a great debt of thanks because while they have price controls on those pharmaceuticals, we invented them. Yep. Okay, now uh, a few housekeeping items. The first is extremely important. We are not going to let Mark out of here. A bag! <laughs> Until he gets a bag. Now, uh, when I was uh, with Mark last, a few weeks ago, if you could open that up, uh, we went out to lunch and he had with him Hold on a jacket. Looks like it's one that Ronald Reagan actually gave him. I mean, a long time ago. <laughs> and we thought what would be really nice, Mark, is wow. to have for you a authentic Ronald Reagan jacket with your name embroidered on it. Wow. We have matching pants? Well, we've got a matching hat, okay? <laughs> An Air Force One cap for Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, this other gift is particularly special. There are just a few dozen of these in the world. Uh, this is a copy of the diaries of Ronald Reagan signed by both Nancy Reagan and President Reagan himself. Thanks to the Reagan Library. God bless you all. Thank you, John. Thanks for coming. Okay, some, uh, some really important housekeeping items so you don't find your way into the parking lot before you should. You actually want to go over and have a meal. For those of you uh, who've been watching on the screens in the Air Force One Pavilion, you just need to go downstairs to where the meals are. 
for everyone that's here on this first floor, uh, if you're, um, the staff will escort you right over here, out these doors across the Peace Plaza to Air Force One Pavilion. So just please follow them through those doors. And if you're up on the pavilion, I mean up on the mezzanine upstairs, the staff will escort you through an exit right over here to your right. Uh, we'd like to um, let you know that if anyone here was trying to get a book signed that didn't, there'll be signed books by Mark over in the Air Force One Pavilion that you can get a hold of. And the plane is open until 8.30 as well. Uh, so please enjoy yourself. We look forward to seeing you at dinner. Thank you very much.